Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, we appreciate you being here. We have been part of the lecture series here at Fairhaven Senior Services for 40 years. Um, our faculty and staff love getting off campus and out of the classroom and, and talking with people who aren't always concerned with what's on the exam, right? So um, this is really, it's really a joy for all of us to come over here and thank you for having us for 40 years. That is what we're celebrating this fall. So we do have um, some of our best faculty and programs um, coming to talk with you this fall. So this is our second lecture of the series. I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education, and we're pleased to host uh, Professor John Werner. He is a professor in the Department of Management at UW-Whitewater. He was the Roseman Teaching Award recipient at UW-Whitewater for 22-23. That's our highest teaching award at UW-Whitewater. He is the co-author of two books, Human Resource Development, Talent Development in its eighth edition and Merit Pay in its second edition with Robert Henneman. He is also a co-editor and contributing author for Business and Society, Building Skills and Awareness for the Workplace in second edition 2021. For three years, he served as the co-editor of the journal Human Resource Development Quarterly. Please welcome Professor John Werner. Thank you. It is really a delight to be here, and I know some of you. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about lifelong learning. Learning for the ages is a bit ambiguous, and I meant that on purpose. Who here has ever taught at any point in their career? Boy, most hands going up. Well, thank you. I applaud you. Let's give a hand for everyone, the teacher here. I was telling some of you as I was waiting for, I, I should have brought my connecting things. I, I know that as a Mac user, but I didn't do that, so we got it sorted out. Uh, I moved here in January of 1998. I would not recommend starting anything mid-year. That was not an easy thing for my three children, uh, but they all went through Washington. Hannah, I know you were a teacher there, and uh, uh, my son graduated from Madison, my middle daughter from Berkeley College of Music out in Boston, and my youngest from here at UW Whitewater with a degree in uh, electronic communications. And so uh, I've had very good experience here. Uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I was born in Michigan. This is my mother. I was just with her. I haven't yet convinced her to come. Maybe Brian can help me with that. She's 90 and living in Florida. Uh, and we toured last summer. But, oh, it's so cold, and I can't change the cold, and I can't promise her it's not going to snow. So, so far, we haven't convinced her. But she now has two books, one about her artwork and one for StoryWorth, where she wrote out her life stories for a, a one a week for a year. And we've published it with pictures, and it's really quite uh, something. So this is Dorothy, and so I want to honor and respect her as a teacher as I go through this. I love this. It's a Hasidic proverb. For the unlearned, old age is winter. For the learned, it is a season of harvest. So this month, I turn 66 and a half, wow. which you know uh, probably means that this is my full Social Security. But uh, I'm going to work through next summer, and then I'll retire. Uh, but uh, I hope for each of you, as it will be for me, that we can see uh, old age. Because there's a point of this, um, of learning uh, and continuing to learn that keeps us active, that keeps us sharp. So thank you all for coming, and I'm very grateful uh, for your being here. You might have seen my pray see. This gives away a little bit of what I want to talk about. Uh, there's been some major discussions in education and elsewhere about how we teach people, and does it change based on how old a person is? So I'm going to ask you to engage with me. I'm going to ask for some interaction. Now, I understand uh, there's been some uh, uh, concern recently for COVID here in Whitewater, so I, I, I get that. Uh, but as much as we can, given the parameters here, I'd like to make this a discussion. So how about uh, anyone willing to, to share? As you went through school, let's think up through high school, about how much would you guess the person, the teacher, the instructor was talking versus other things happening in the classroom? Could you hazard a percentage? Was it 50%, 70%, 80%? What would you think? Anyone willing to share? 80%? Anyone think it was more? More? You think it was lower? What other things were you doing? This is K through 12 now, besides having the teacher teach. Sleeping. 
Not counting sleeping. What else? Daydreaming. Daydreaming, yeah. So you engage them with the vocabulary. Yeah, there was yeah. one that talked and I yep. was doing Right, right. Okay. So one of the interesting things, when I ask my undergraduates, I often hear 90, 95%. And they're talking about classes in the College of Business and Economics. They think that 90% of the time the instructor is talking. So is that really true? I'm not sure. And I actually have some data that I'm going to show uh, you about this. But uh, there is this perception, especially in K-12, that it's a lot of one-way communication. And what's the problem with that? Many people don't do well with that because it's not as active as people are looking for. So you heard some of my background. Uh, I was at the University of South Carolina. When you see a resume like this, those of you in academia, it either means you were trying to move up or you didn't get tenure. And I didn't get tenure at the University of South Carolina. And I don't mind talking about that. There were things I could control and things I couldn't. But this has been a very good place for me to land, for my children, uh, for my career. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how things came about in a way that was actually very good for me. I reluctantly served as our department chair for four years. I know Don was a department chair in finance for a number of years. I didn't like it, but I did it. I did my duty, and then I was happy to get out of that. Uh, one of the things that's, that's come alive for me is we have a doctorate in business administration, usually 10 to 15 people coming in every fall. And they're aiming to be done in three and a half years with a dissertation. And we've just admitted our 10th cohort or class. And it's doing very well. Our students are doing well. And just some of the wonderful stories. So I get them, they come five weekends a semester, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I get them on Friday afternoon for each of those in their second year. And the second semester, I get to focus on teaching. So it's like my whole life has come full circle as I get to teach about teaching. And it's just been really interesting. So uh, one of the ways that research is evaluated and is, is in citations. And a common way that we look at that now is Google Scholar citations. And I don't know if you know this, but the person with the most Google Scholar citations at the UW-Whitewater is Professor Benjamin in physics. He has over 10,000. And recently, Jimmy Peltier in business just went over 10,000. Praveen Parbotia is third, and I'm actually fourth. What I did not know, I was put up for the Regents Teaching Excellence Award. I didn't get that. I got the Roseman, but not the Regents Award. But in doing that was the first time in my life that I looked at how many of my citations were related to teaching. And I was pleased and amazed that almost a third Almost a third of all of my citations, counting uh, my textbook, uh, were uh, to things that were related to teaching. So I've been teaching about teaching, and I just didn't know it. So th this is the fun piece uh, about this. So the, the book has been interesting because sometimes when things don't work out, you can get bitter. But sometimes life has a way of surprising you. When I was a master's student, a professor came to Michigan State where I was getting my MBA, and he had written a complete manuscript, 10 chapters, and he mailed it off to his co-author in Seattle, Washington, and it never arrived. And he didn't make a copy. And this is before computers. So he had to redo. He had all his notes, but he didn't have his actual chapters. So he had to redo this under deadline. And I became his research assistant because I'd taught, taken an undergraduate course in training and development. So the book came out. And I kept thinking, maybe someday he'd ask me to join him. And he never did. So OK, that was a little bit of a disappointment. So I get here. And the first year I'm here, I get a call from someone I knew, a book rep. And he says, hey, John, how'd you like to take over a textbook? What are you talking about? Well, D. Simone and Harris, which was a competitor to the other book, uh, one man sadly died, and the other one just lost heart. So they offered me the book for the third edition. And here is the eighth edition. And so I've been doing it since, this, uh, since then. And uh, I don't mind telling you that the, the things have changed. It's not as lucrative as it once was, but this paid for 
all three of my kids' education. So thank you very much. So, mm -hmm. so the interesting thing is that I mentioned to some of you, you heard this, I got to teach seven times at Shula Longkorn University. This is the King's University in Thailand. It's considered like their Harvard, one of their top programs because of the book. So the book gave me access to teaching in Thailand, and now I want to bring back some of the things that I've learned. One of the things that I was told when I went to Bangkok is, oh, the Thai students don't like to talk in class. They're very shy, so you're going to have a hard time getting them to talk. And I had already decided that I wanted some interaction. I wanted there to be some interaction. And so uh, I kept that going, but the interesting thing is that I found that there was something that worked very well uh, in uh, getting them to talk, and I'm gonna share that with you as we go through, uh, as I go through what I'm gonna talk about. I wish to honor the Green Hills. Uh, I am really grateful for Dr. Greenhill's leadership as chancellor uh, as I came here, and I'm so grateful that they can both be here. And I know each of you have contributed in, in, in different ways, but for me, this is very personal and special that you are in the room here with me. And this is as I remember you in, at that time as I came in January 1980. So thank you both. Thank you for your contributions to the university and to my life. So, pedagogy. If you've taught, you know this word. We're talking about how we teach. What is the best way to teach a subject? We often think of the content, but really we're thinking about how do we work with the course content? How do we promote learning, and what do we do here? So, a very common framework is Benjamin Bloom's taxonomy. I have to say that for most instructors, myself included, we talk about this more than we actually put this into practice. We spend most of our time at the bottom, right, remembering and understanding. And it's hard to get to the top, to analyze, evaluate, create. But this is a goal. And increasingly, we're being challenged. When I teach online classes, we're actually pushed to say, okay, how are you moving beyond just comprehension and understanding? What is it that you're going to ask people to do? So in my online staffing class, they're creating a job description, they're creating a staffing plan, and they're creating an appraisal instrument for that. And those are all practical things that are, they're doing uh, as very hands-on ways to try to apply the material. So here's my million-dollar question for today. How do you think adults want to learn? What is it that might be different than how children want to learn? Anyone want to uh, express a thought here? Uh, I thought of group discussion, but I think I'll forego that today. But what, what, um, what ideas do you have for, how is it that ad adults might want to learn? Go ahead. All right, so the, the difference between then, meaning not so much using virtual or Zoom or something like that. Okay, so thank you. Face to face. I would want to learn by doing. Yeah, okay. Probably more focus on not just learning facts, but trying to get to some doing or action. Yeah. I didn't catch your name. But Alicia. Alicia. Alicia, talk about being a non-traditional student. Yep. Um, when the instructors found out that I non-traditional. Oh, I'm sorry. Can we bring the microphone? Is it possible? Yeah. yeah thank you. This is no, no. This is great. That this is exactly what I was hoping. We have a microphone, so. Yeah, and if I don't catch it in time, you can, you know, if it's a short answer. Yeah, this is important. Yeah. Let's hear Alicia. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Can we start over. Yes. Start over. Okay. When I started uh, going to classes, most of the students that were in the classroom were traditional students. They were right out of high school. And when the instructors found out that I was the non-traditional student, a lot of times they held, asked me privately if I would be willing to talk about my experiences mm -hmm. with the other classmates, um, especially when we were doing things that were history-related or mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. 
things that I'd done through my life. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to get some of the reactions from the traditional students because a couple of them came up to me and they're like, you did all of that? And I'm like, yeah, I did, without a degree. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Many times my traditional students, the 18 to 22-year-olds, get a little frustrated with people like Alicia because their, their hand is always up, right? They're always having something they want to say. And if they're just in go mode, all they want is, what do I need to know? What's on the exam? And let me get out of here. And so the, it, a stereotype is that the, the adult learner wants to see the so what, wants to get to the why piece. So I think that leads into, uh, there's an adult learning uh, professor, and he became a guru in my field of human research development, Malcolm Knowles. And he created a word, andragogy, or the andragogical model, and his argument was that adults want more engagement. They want things to be different than uh, a, a more one-way communication. So these are some of his points. Adults are more self-directed. They already have knowledge and experience. They're ready to learn relevant tasks. They're motivated to learn, and they expect to apply learning immediately. Now, that's a positive view of the adult learner. And I think most of us can nod our head and say, I can see how there's some of that that's true there. Now, if you know anything about what's happening now in K-12, what are they moving away from? One-way communication. And what are they moving towards? More active uh, types of things. So one of the points I want to make to you is that I don't think it's a matter of age. I think it's a matter of how do we learn best. And most of us learn best when we are engaged in some way beyond just taking in knowledge, taking in information. Does that make sense? All right, so here are two schematics. As instructors, we tend to gravitate one way or another. The one on the left is our more traditional instructor model. This is what we can call the sage on the stage. I'm in front, I've got the podium, I've got the knowledge, and you're there to listen to me. The other one, down here, is sometimes called the guide on the side. That's a different model. The one with the knowledge to pass down from on high versus the one to help guide and facilitate. Now, can anyone be completely one or the other today? I don't think so. But what I think is working it, for me and for many others is to try to get the learner to be a part of and to engage in this, it's to be more out there. So one of the things that I mentioned from Thailand that worked is that they were, they were scared to death to ever say anything that might contradict me. That was just a cultural thing. If anything might seem like it's different than what I would think or believe, they didn't want to say it. But when I would ask them a question and they could talk about it in their groups, and then they could report back what their group said, that was much less threatening, and that tended to work. So it was interesting that that breaking it out and then having them come back. So here's the fascinating thing. So I now do student-led discussions, and the whole point is to get students used to being in this guide on the side model. So they take a portion of a chapter, and I just had one on Thursday, and it was on this topic, it was on this very topic, and they had to come up with questions and then come up with a summary at the end. But what they did, without my prompting, is that they went out and had, had them talk in their, their groups and then come back with answers. Now, why does that matter? Even today, there are many undergraduate students who are nervous about speaking in class. Who it's, that's not their area of comfort. I'm shy. What if I say the wrong thing? It's an issue of self-efficacy. Do I think I can do this? And so many of them, they have to feel like it's a safe environment, that no one's going to make fun of them, no one's going to, to berate them, and certainly not me. And when they realize suddenly that it's safe and that they can make comments, and, and there's a little incentive that they, I give them for speaking, but it, it's interesting how that little thing from Thailand moving more towards 
the right, the guide on the side, has made a difference in, in my teaching. All right, when you think of your very favorite teachers or instructors, what comes to mind? What do you think of in terms of qualities or characteristics? A Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so. Can anyone name out some of the things that you liked about your favorite teachers? Okay, sincerity, that they, you thought that they meant what they said? Good, thank you. Any other thoughts? Yes? Well, your idea of engagement, I had, a, a, I had what I considered a good social studies teacher when I was in Oh, yeah, thank you. Freshman in high school. And I have noted, oh, oh dear, okay. <laughs> I, I, I would nominate social study teachers as people who engage their students. And it has been my experience personally and the experience of a mother of four children, all of whom became interested in reading the newspaper and so forth because of an exciting social studies teacher. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Would you take the mic for the rest? She was a nun, and she was principal of the high school, and she taught all the higher math courses and science courses. And what I liked about her, she never berated anybody. Yeah, thank you. And that's important, isn't it? And again, sometimes we have those fears of the, and again, there's that stereotype of some of the, the mean <laughs> parochial school teachers, uh, nuns or otherwise. But yes, wait, wait for... Right. Absolutely. That's very good. We could hear that, couldn't we? I'm going to skip the first one, but if you uh, want the link, I can certainly make this available. It's a TED Talk, and these are excellent ways to get really good uh, material. Ramsey Masalam is a high school science teacher, and what he basically does is try to get the students asking questions and building their creativity rather than just telling them trying to get them to ask the question about why. And, and that's a key thing that I think we often lose. We lose sight of the fact that there's uh, a creative aspect. All right. Uh, <laughs> I asked my undergraduates, and they all think that I should show this next clip to you. So I, I, I blame it on them if you don't like this. But do any of you remember the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Does that strike a bell with anyone? All right, well, there's a, a horrible stereotype here, but I'm going to play it. Um, and if you were an econ professor, I apologize. Uh, this is not meant to be uh, poking fun at you directly. But um, here we go. Oh, can I see it? No. I can get it. All right. All right. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone? ...to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point, this is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something D-O-O -O economics. Voodoo economics. <laughs> All right, that's pretty irreverent, but it... All right, here we go. 
All right, so I want to talk about active learning. If most people don't love lecturing, why do we do it? Well, it's easier. It is harder to know how people are going to respond. I had no idea if you were going to answer any of my questions, right? I, I didn't know. Would there be people here? Would they answer? But active learning is the idea that people want to engage. Now, this is every professor's dream, right? Every hand up, and uh, it even cuts off the instructor's head because it's the focus is on the engagement here. Uh, a fun story. I showed that picture in Thailand, and they're having fun. They saw that, and then they started waving their hands just to say, okay, we can do that. Uh, but they were, they, they were engaged, as I'm talking about this, these are the students, and they were so much fun to, to teach. But they got that because they realized that it was more fun for them to engage than to simply sit and listen and be fearful of saying the wrong thing. And so that was a major breakthrough uh, for them and for me. Now, as I'm teaching my DBA students, I ask them this question. Okay, active learning is good. Yes, yes. Okay, so do you believe in it? Well, of course I believe in it. What do you mean? So let me just do a little uh, progression here. Anyone ever heard of Jean-Francois Gravelo? Does that name mean anything? You might have actually heard of him as the great blondine. Does that connect to anyone? So he came over from France he was an acrobat, typewriter walker in the 1800s, and he came to the U.S. in 1855, and one of his stunts was to drum up support. Could he walk across the typewriter across the Niagara Falls? So, of course, never been done. No, you can't do that. So he gets all these people there to the Niagara Falls, and they put somehow they get a, a typewriter across. So you know where this is going. He does it. He walks across, and the people are cheering. Oh, this is great. So do you believe that I can do it carrying something? Then he does that. Do you believe I can do it with a wheelbarrow? Maybe. So this is a true, this is an actual picture. There he is with his wheelbarrow. <laughs> okay, so we believe, we believe. Do you believe I can do it carrying a person in the wheelbarrow? Oh, <laughs> are you willing to get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> That's a different question, isn't it? I believe you can do it. I believe you can do it with her, but mm, I don't I want, I want to be the one. That's what it feels like as an instructor many times to commit to active learning. And honestly, some days are good and some days are not so good. And I can't always control. We have a... a potential IT catastrophe tomorrow, we have to now use our phones to log into the system, and it's called a duo system, and you can't get into the system now if you don't have your phone to uh, say it's you. As of Friday, over half of our students had not yet signed up, and at, by tomorrow, they can't access anything on campus if they don't have their phones and have it all set up. This is an IT catastrophe. So what did I do? <laughs> I had this group that's going to present tomorrow send it to me today so I have it in the system so I don't have to worry about that. But again, the, the issue here is that very often active learning is painful. It's rewarding, but it's not easy because you just don't have the same amount of control. I think sometimes why professors like it is because you know exactly what you're going to say. You have your notes. You can control things. And I think students are just used to it. Let me come in and take my notes and be done. And frankly, it's more work to have to come prepared and to come to engage than it is to just sit and listen. I like this. This is a Canadian professor that needs to be uh, active engagement needs to be demanded. So I was a part of a study. We were wondering what do our faculty in the College of Business and Economics do? There was some concern that there was too much lecturing. So we did a survey, and we got about 80% of all the faculty and academic staff to complete our survey. So it was a pretty good response. We asked them what they were doing in their classroom time. So we typically have two 75-minute periods each week. That's a typical class time. So I don't know if you can see that. It's a little small, but lecture, 
discussions, small group, working on problems, case discussions, student presentations, audiovisual content, individual reflections, simulations, and other like guest speakers. So we ask them to say, how much time are you spending on each? So anyone want to throw out a guess? How much did faculty think they were lecturing? What did faculty think? I told you what students think. Not, not 80%, right? What they're thinking, what they hope they're No, what, what did they, they there's, we asked them to break down what they think they were actually doing in the classroom. Well, they said it was less than half. That there was discussion, small group activity, problems, case discussion, student presentations, audiovisual, not much individual reflection, and some simulations. The other were guest speakers. We then asked them, okay, think for what we would like to do. You're one step ahead of me. What would you like to do in, the, in a, a target class? Would you like to want to change that? The lecture went down a little bit, and a couple of those percentages went up. My undergraduates, their first response is, there's no way that this can possibly be true. This is not my experience. Now, some of it is that they would tend to lump in discussion as lecture. In their heads, that's, it's, it's all part of it. But it happened that I did this on Thursday in a day when there was a student-led discussion, which was 15 of the 75. So I was already at 80% for that class. So I said, what do you think it is in here? <laughs> it can't be more than 80, because you just had 15 minutes. Well, we tried to follow up of the uh, 100 or so that responded, only 13 actually let us come in. We had a student with a stopwatch timing how much the instructor talked. Whenever they were talking, the stopwatch was on, and whether something else was happening, you know, whatever, it was not. Well, it was 45%, pretty close to what the instructors thought. Now, that's only 13, so that's a dubious sample. I was one of them. Mine was 60%. And actually, I feel pretty good about that because there was student-led uh, discussion. There was uh, cases and things like that. There was a zero. <laughs> it was all problem solving. It was a finance class. It wasn't Don, but it was someone else in finance. It was, it was all problem solving, and the instructor was truly just walking around to groups the whole class period. That 77.6 was one of my colleagues in management who talked an awful lot. That's a high number, and, and that was uh, in the test one. So we published this in a, a higher education journal, and it's starting to get some notice here. We asked some questions. Is active learning important for undergraduate education? Yes, strongest agreement out of five, four out of five. My course requires more lecturing, three and a half, so that's a common thing. Well, I have all this material I have to get through. I have to do this for this test or for that. It's a common thing that you hear faculty say, but only three and a half. Course conducive to cases discussion in the middle. Active learning is vital to graduate education in the middle. I'm more comfortable lecturing. They didn't agree with that. That was the kicker. Use more cases and graduate courses, and that was not true. This set off fire alarms in my dean's suite. My dean was uh, like, no, we cannot, because we're, we're boasting that we're using cases in our graduate courses. So there's another term, not active learning, but action learning. And if you've heard of action learning, it's doing something with what you learn. So we went through this whole process for a year in trying to engage people. And I'm pleased to say that there was more, there was a change that came as a result of this in the college because of the feedback and the, the follow-up from, from this thing. So I want to further differentiate active learning and experiential learning. Active learning would be things like we're doing right now, having some discussion, having something like a case study or something that we're doing in the classroom. Experiential learning would be like an internship, a student teacher uh, going and doing things, um, some type of uh, cooperative uh, or community-based learning. I really like this from Sue Wigston. The main difference between active and experiential learning is that the former is learning by participating, reading, writing, discussing. The latter is learning by doing, actually carrying out tasks and seeing the results. And so uh, what she goes on to say is that, and I would agree with this, 
that the more we can do, the more we can get to actually doing things, the greater the retention. I think one of the weaknesses from elementary through undergraduate education is that we've assumed that getting a good grade on a test means that you've learned something. And we all know that that's not true. You can get an A on a test and the next day remember nothing, right? So one of my tweets, I don't know what it's called now that Twitter is now X, I don't, I don't, I'm not up to that, but one of the things that I like to say is if it isn't lasting, it isn't learning. If you can't carry it through, then you haven't really learned it, even if you got an A on the test. And so experiential learning has the best retention. So what does that mean? We have to find ways to engage and continue to engage. Now, one of the cool things that you all, I'm sure, have experienced is as you continue to learn and engage, just like being, be, being here today and on these Monday lecture series, it's good for you. It's good for your continued uh, acuity and, and sharpness. But this is, uh, I think, a, a, a really important piece here. One of the things that business schools have promoted with varying degrees of success is using cases. So having something that the student can work on and apply. I try to have one in every chapter that I have the students think about, talk about, and discuss. And then we come back and say, so what did they do? Or what happened? Or what are the outcomes? This goes back to Harvard Business School. They were the first ones to promote this. Anyone want to guess how old the, the case method is? How many decades? Nineteen twenty one, over a hundred years. That's that's an amazing number. They well, yeah, <laughs> it's true. That's true. For but I don't think anyone here is one hundred and three. Are they? Not yet. So it was called the General Shoe Company. It was a one-page case. And it was, why were workers leaving work early? They were clocking out before they were supposed to. And what was going on? And was it the managers not caring? Was it the, there was only one bathroom and they had to all get through the bathroom? But it's presented kind of like a detective story. Well, this is a total transformation in how management was taught. That rather than just hear our principles, Let's get the student to engage and ask about this. So there's now a, a write-up from Harvard, uh, and this is called Because Wisdom Can't Be Told. And it's, it's important here because you have to understand that the Harvard model is 0% lecture. All cases in discussion. 100% in the classroom, cases in discussion. Zero lecture. What did I say? That the students think that we're, no, that we're 80% lecture, and the, the faculty think that we're about 50% lecture. Harvard is 0%. It's all cases and discussion. But the argument, and this has been consistent for 100 years, I want to just read this next part. Uh, it can be said flatly that the mere act of listening to wise statements and sound advice is little for anyone. <laughs> meaning you have to do something with it. And this is Charles Gregg. He wrote it in 1940. It was reproduced in 1992. But this rattles especially my, my current students because this isn't their experience. But they finally, it's like the lights come on that, okay, this isn't just a time waster, a time filler. I can apply and learn and grow, and it's one step closer to active learning. I don't know if you can see these pictures. This is my first group that I taught in the DBA program. This is cohort one in some of the faculty. One of the things in management that's often very hard to get across is that the way organizations are structured matters to how people behave. And so you can talk about these theories, and it's like, yeah, OK, so what? But this is a one where they have different instructions, and they have to build a Lego model. And I picked Star Wars. And each one has different directions. And one is very bureaucratic and mechanical. And everyone, to, everyone has to touch it. And the one is just like no instruction whatsoever and just figure it out. So they have, a, uh, under tight time constraints, 
Usually the bureaucratic one gets more done, but they're very frustrated, and the organic is more loose, and it, but the, with the more time they have, the better the organic goes. And so then we have this wild debriefing. Oh, in one of the groups, they have to fire someone. The, the direction is someone has to get kicked out of the group midway through, and that's called the downsized group. And so uh, this is fun, but it's also a way to bring this to, to life, that these organizational things matter. And so one of the things that I found is that these types of things really do make a difference in how uh, people respond. One of the things that I had never done until I started teaching the DBA seminar is I had never written my own teaching statement. I know most people in education, that's just a given, or in K-12, you have a teaching statement, a statement of your philosophies and how you want to teach. I'd never done one. I never had to do one. Well, increasingly, for new faculty positions, they expect you to have a teaching statement, a research statement, a diversity statement, uh, and your CV. So I wrote one, and this was my picture of what I would like to do. What is a, a, an orchestra conductor? There's some directing, there's some bringing out, but it's trying to see that the whole orchestra comes out and there's not too much and too little. And that is a picture that I like. And I, I ask them, what do you want? What do you want to be? What do you want to have? So there's a man named Roger Nirenberg. Uh, nope, we don't have time. Uh, if you ever want to, it's just called The Music Paradigm, Roger Nirenberg. There was a nice PBS news hour about him. Uh, he takes orchestras that he hasn't worked with, and he goes to different cities, and I saw him do this in Nashville. And he does different things as a conductor, and then he stops, and you're all right there. You're kind of interspersed with the orchestra. And so it's like, leadership and over leadership and problem solving and he does all these wonderful things my masters and dba students just eat this up because they get it they understand the parallels here and very often people in organizations so he's hired by organizations and the pbs one is about him going to new york presbyterian hospital and how these different parts of the hospital often don't like each other don't talk to each other and realizing that they have to have more coordination and uh, things, so they do this. I was vulnerable with you, and I didn't have to tell you that I didn't get tenure at the University of South Carolina. I could have omitted that and just glossed it over. But it's an important part of my story. I came here partly because I had decided I wanted to have my family first, I didn't want to work on Sundays, that, that that was an important value for me, and this seemed a better fit uh, for me. I've done well, I've prospered, and I've, I've thrived here. It's been a very good place for me and for my family. My middle daughter is back here in Whitewater raising her family, so she wants to be here. Clayton Christensen was a leading uh, management scholar at Harvard Business School. Back in 2010, he wrote this. Don't worry about the level of individual prominence you have achieved. Worry about the individuals you have helped become better people. This is my final recommendation. Think about the metric by which your life will be judged and make a resolution to live every day so that in the end, your life will be judged a success. That's a, a personal response, but this resonates with me, and I hope it does with you. There's a term that Eric Erickson used called generativity. That's giving on to those who come after us. That can be children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. It can be others. Uh, but that's what I, I hope you see here, that there's, as we think about uh, uh, these things, that there's, there's so much that can be given back, paid forward, and those types of things. I don't know if it's con Confucius or not, but uh, someone said, tell me I forget, show me I remember, involve me I understand. That's active learning. That's what I've been trying to communicate today. And Moses is attributed in Psalm 90 as saying, teach us to number our days aright that we might gain a heart of wisdom. That's a hope for all of us. That's a hope for me as I move towards my retirement. Uh, these are things that I hope uh, resonate with you, that there's, there's something to be said for 
active learning, but there's also something to be said for lifelong learning. And what I hope I've encouraged you is that it doesn't matter the age. It matters your intention. It matters what you're going to do with this. And you're putting these together. So that's what I want to leave you with. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Werner. We do have some time for questions or if you want to share. Yeah, let me come over here with the microphone quick. Yeah. I need to sit closer. To yeah, why don't you? <laughs> have you or anyone ever done this type of thing with a laboratory science class? Well, it's interesting because we've been having these celebrating teaching and learning conferences every spring now on campus. It's a one-day event. And uh, there are people now in the sciences that are doing these very things. And it's been fun for me because I didn't know the answer to that. But these last two years, there's a, a, an academic staff person who is doing this very thing and trying to bring it into. What department is he in? It's a woman, and I, I'm blanking on her name. I'll have to come, I'll come up with it. But what department? But, um, chemistry, I think. Yeah, I think it's chemistry. Yeah, but she's, she's just going gangbusters. I'll, I can find it before I leave. I can find the program, and I can, I can come up with that. So, yes, the good news is that this is not – sometimes – so a lot of this, if you're in education, it's like, come on, we've been doing this for decades. But in business, we hadn't been so much, and I think science, the hard science is even less. And so these are some things that are kind of newer to, to some parts of uh, academia. Thank you. For that question. I'll, I'll, I'll find your name. Other, yeah, let me come over here. My belief is that, that uh, student discussions of things they have no knowledge about are very invaluable. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was teaching, in order to get the students to be, be able to discuss things, I'd quiz them before we even talked about a topic. Um, I don't know if they were happy with that. I think they probably were not in general, but, but it was the only way I could get them to know anything before we talked about it. Thank you. And I, I would agree with the, the sentiment. I don't test that way, but it, yeah, that's one of the reasons why discussions often fail if they haven't done the reading, if they haven't. Uh, and so I think especially in an area like finance where it's critical that you really know what you're talking about. And so, yeah, I, I know that one thing I'm doing in my master's class is that they can do an open book class review that's due at the start of the week, and then we do the online discussions for the rest of the week. So I'm kind of following in that type of model there. But it's true. And I think that that's one of the reasons why um, sometimes people get frustrated with discussions if people are just mouthing off whatever they want to say that doesn't have anything to do with what is actually needing to be covered or discussed in that. So uh, that's a val very valid point. Thank you, Don. Other comments or questions for Professor Werner? I would like to take one of your classes, I think. <laughs> well, one of the like fun things I can say, yeah, I guess one yeah, more, yeah. is that uh, I've had students at the end say, oh, I didn't think I was going to like discussing, but by the end of the semester, I found I really did. So people can change. People can change their perception of, of a class and, and that it can be fun to engage. So I don't think that I really learned until I had an opportunity to go out and yeah. do. Yeah. And that's when it all put together. Yeah. And that's when I really realized that some of the stuff that I did back in college was really kind of interesting and important. <laughs> Thank you. That's a perfect, shall we, shall we end on that one? That sounds like a really yeah, good place I to end I don't think it. we can do better than that as our final. So thank you all very much. I'm so grateful for you. So yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Professor Werner. Thank you all for joining us and come up and chat with us if you would like or have time. Thank you, everybody.